I am uh, quite happy to introduce uh, Professor Jean Robert Tiran, um, someone I know for a few years now, quite a few years now. Uh, professor uh, Jean Robert Tiran is a professor of public economics at the University of Vienna. He's the director of the Vienna Center for Experimental Economics um, and currently serves as the vice director for research and international affairs at the University of Vienna. No, um, uh, he's a leading expert, particularly in bringing the experimental uh, and behavioral approach to understanding political behavior. Uh, most of, uh, at least he mainly has investigated so far how bounded rationality and social preferences shape institutions such as uh, markets, for example, and, and, and democracy uh, as, a, as another, uh, another example. Um, so with, he's quite an accomplished scholar with over 50 publications and counting uh, in leading journals, including American Economic Review, Econometrica, and, and Science. Um, I have read some of his papers because I am familiar with the area of his work and I work with him. And I can tell you, uh, based on how, how he works, pretty much every one of his papers are, are crafted carefully with tremendous amount of work uh, and, and, and deep thought, yeah? Um, so, so I have been fortunate to work with him and uh, what amazes, I mean, I don't want to talk about things you probably can already look up. What, what amazes me is the fact that he continues to remain curious every day uh, uh, from, from, his, from his own discipline to medicine, to astrophysics. And I remember him telling me that one of the, one of the perks of the job he really hoped for with taking up the job of vice director for research and international affairs is that he would he would get to learn these things every day yeah and i can i can i can assure you uh, when i sit with him it's like wow how can he be so curious every day it's almost childlike yeah so this is uh, this desire to learn every day is is, is, is fantastic yeah uh, the other thing which really i think uh, is worth noting uh, if, and I'm not, I'm not surprising is the fact is, is, is his work ethic. I don't know if it's his Swiss upbringing or, or what it is. It is really hard to beat. You know, for, for me, it's hard to admit this, but it is hard to beat. Uh, for example, last only last Saturday, he comes in straight from, from the airport from Berlin and he comes in straight into his office, says, okay, let's meet in the office. And he works straight four straight hours on our draft, hitting, hitting at the computer while I'm just getting tired. And by six o'clock, I, I resign and say, okay, fine. I'll, I'll, that's time for me to leave. But he... he what he does is just steams on to go on to prepare for the talk today, uh, and um, <laughs> un until right. until very until the very last minute. He, he, uh, and so, having known him so much, uh, quite a bit, I know that this talk would be tailor made for the occasion. Uh, it'll ha it'll have some uh, undoubtedly it'll be undoubtedly profound and and thought provoking. So, thank you so much for accepting this uh, invitation. And uh, so, thank you very much for this uh, for the invitation. Thanks for the very generous. Uh, introduction. Um, the host has spotlighted your video to everyone. Okay, join the audio. Yes, no, I don't do anything. Okay. Um, so it's a great pleasure to be here and to talk a little bit about uh, evidence based policy. As has been said, I'm an experimental economist, so I professionally think about evidence, what is good evidence. And, but I will not touch so much on it in uh, during this talk about experimental approaches I will more uh, kind of delve into my experience as vice rector uh, of the largest university in Austria and uh, actually in the German speaking area so my talk today I haven't done research on this topic actual research so my talk will not be so much evidence-based, it will be more experience-based. Uh, so I will talk a little bit about uh, what I came across during my, my work as a vice rector, some observations uh, I have made. And uh, so when I talk about the role of a public university here, I mainly mean this one, which is a large international um, research-oriented uh, university. It's in a capital, so we have some connection to pol policy making, policy makers, but it's also has, has some things in common with other big universities. For example, the, the event that Anand just mentioned when I came from Berlin was we were sitting together with the people from Humboldt Universität and the University of Zurich uh, to the rectorates 
to exchange views on issues that are similar. So because we have, we have similar issues, similar perspectives. So um, do we actually shape public policies as a, as a university? Yes, we do by, uh, so maybe I should first say why I put this, this title public university. Uh, so it's uh, like the University of Vienna, I already mentioned that. So public means uh, that we are mainly taxpayer funded. So which means that the mission we have is partly determined by the government. We have a Leistungsvereinbarung, performance agreement. And there's also the mission we have is partly determined by this idea that we're uh, taxpayer funded. So do we shape public policy? Yes, by what we do, what do we do? The main thing, the main impact we have on society is actually through our graduates. We have 10,000 graduates every year go out to work in Vienna, in Austria, in Europe, in the whole world. So if we train these people well, this in the long run has a huge impact on society. And of course, also on you know, ideas about what policy is, what it should be, and on policy uh, making. So, but what is characteristic for our university is that we are a research-based university. So the, the, the particular quality of our teaching is that it's research-based. So at the end of the day, the research uh, will be important and I'll talk about the research. We also have 10,000 employees. Um, many academics and uh, some of them hopefully or all of them hopefully are well trained in these things scientifically literate and so on but some of them also take up public office so my predecessor it has been said i'm a professor of public economics my predecessor in my uh, chair of public economics is uh, van der bellen so yeah the president of the republic uh, my colleague next door is an experimental economist, is the Minister of Economics now. Yeah, it changes all the time, these ministers. Uh, Kocher, Martin Kocher, yeah. And, uh, and my predecessor as vice rector is uh, Fassmann, and he was the Minister of Education. So there are many uh, relations between um, the university, the personnel of the university, uh, and policy makers in one way or another. Um, of course, many of our academics uh, are involved in public debate. They uh, write in, in the newspapers, they appear on TV, they participate in public discussion and um, talk about all kinds of, I will come back to that, typically current policy issues because that's where the demand comes from. Uh, and provide all kinds of, you know, contextualization narratives, all kinds of things they do when they speak to the general public. And some will actively advise policymakers, and that's going to be the main topic of this talk today, where you deliberately advise a policymaker on a particular policy. And this will be, uh, I will mainly talk about scientific policy advice. So, um, so, as I already said, research is crucial in our, in our teaching. Research will be crucial in scientific policy advice. So, the research has many effects on, on our policies. One is, and, and we do mainly basic research, but also some, some applied research. And the basic research we do contributes to a long-run understanding of important issues. Um, it, and basic research is about answering questions, whereas applied research is more about solving problems and, and proposing solutions. So, uh, but I think both of these, especially in the long run, also basic research is very important uh, for, for the sh how policies are shaped and, and, the, and understanding what is a good policy. Many poly uh, disciplines can contribute, of course, the social sciences first and foremost, but also the humanities now in the war in Ukraine, many of our historians, many of our uh, professors of Slavic studies, Slavic culture appear on TV and explain the situation. Uh, uh, 
yeah, the whole contextualized the whole uh, thing. Also, natural science. If you think COVID, uh, there was a huge demand on you know how to interpret things, what to do. Climate change is still on the agenda. It, it's gone down a bit. Was not the top priority with the war and COVID, but will come back very soon. So, how do they do this? Uh, how do they provide this long-run impact on, on understanding what is policy, what policies should be done, what is a good policy, is by writing papers that are later cited by people who then do the hands-on stuff. Yeah? In the ministries, there are uh, practitioners who advise their ministers what to do, uh, policy analysts for, for money, policy analysts, consultants, and so on. So they will consume this type of research uh, that we do. And also our scientists help to organize databases. We run special databases to study democracy, for example. We operate those. We operate uh, surveys, panels. Uh, this is very important as an input for analysts. So um, it's also important to understand while our university is organized in faculty traditionally we're a very old university 1365 uh, has been founded and our university is structured in in faculties and centers so there are like 20 of those too many yeah, they are in, in silos and so much of the interesting research that happens at the university of vienna is cross-structural so it's interdisciplinary and uh, I just give you some uh, examples of what I am currently really these days uh, concerned with what as a vice director of research I'm concerned with research strategy and establishing such uh, research initiatives they are called a research platform research Verbund hub actually is called. So we have just started a call just last week. There was a call. We want to bring together at the University of Vienna, everyone who does research on climate and environment, not only natural scientists, also social scientists, economists, and so on. To, and, and we are an enormous powerhouse. It was not clear to us that we, are, we do such great research because they were all dispersed and throughout all the faculties. Now we bring them together. Boku will have to uh, wear warmer clothes now. Uh, right, so it's going to be one of our research priority areas. Society and health is another one that we will establish. Also, I mean, COVID is a good example that you want, if you want to address these uh, crises, it's not enough to look at RNA transmission or vaccines as such. You need to understand the whole uh, context of, of, you know, what type of measures do people accept um, what cost is it going to have if we implement this or that policy? Uh, democracy, we are very strong in, in political science and communication. We are in the top uh, 20 in the world, actually, in communication science. In political science, we have just won, I think, six or seven ERC grants in the last three or four years. So it's absolute top. Uh, we're, I'm, I was vice rector. I'm very excited about our Faculty of Social Science. Uh, we are also active here and um, excellence initiative on democracy is one of our strong points. Data science also, we're still trying to figure out what it means. Data science, this is a difficult concept. <laughs> yeah, it has aspects of informatics, mathematics, artificial intelligence, business analytics, but also digital humanism. You know, how, to, how do we deal with all these digital tools we have what does what does it do to our lives you know, how we find mates how we find a job you know all these things what does it do to our lives that's also part of it so we're trying to figure out how do we organize data science what does it actually mean and then also citizen science science communication these are other initiatives that we are thinking about uh, at present yeah, we are also, as a big university, we're also involved in the Viennese uh, Technology Fund. Uh, I mean, the board of that, and we have uh, argued that the Technology Fund should not only sponsor um, natural sciences, but also social sciences, and the call is coming this summer. So this will be something for, for people in this audience to, to do empirical social science. Yeah.
making making use of quantitative data. So uh, let me talk a little bit about policy now. What are public policies actually? So what to, if you think about the, the dimensions of policy, typically there is a problem, there is something you want, a goal you want to reach, there is an instrument or, an, or a tool that can help you to reach that goal, and there's someone who does it, so to speak. So there's a policy agent, yeah? for example, the government, but if you think more broadly, the actors in policy, in the policy game, if you want, there are very many actors, NGOs, political parties, interest groups, whatnot. And so this is a little bit of vocabulary here. And so one interesting question in, is obviously in the social science and also in economics is one of the core topics we discuss in economics. So if you want to reach a particular goal, how can you do it? And there are a number of things. So this is not something economists typically talk about to change preferences. Yeah? But if we think about the uh, whole global warming issue, uh, the awareness that has been around and you know, the concern for global, this has changed a lot. Yeah? The, the, how you think about the situation, this has changed a lot for, for policy. But then, of course, economists typically think about uh, these things, incentives and subsidies. Austrians are particularly good at subsidizing everything. Uh, I should say I'm Swiss. So there's, that's a big difference between Austria and Switzerland. We don't subsidize things so much. Yeah. Regulation, also Austrians also like to regulate things. So if, if you can't give someone money, then ban it or make it obligatory. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's also another thing. It's also a big difference between Austria and Switzerland. Uh, you know, vaccination, you know, have to do it. Swiss wouldn't, wouldn't come up with this. Nudging is more, more of it in Switzerland that you kind of try to you know, trick people or you know, give them a nudge a little bit to to do things. Anyway, so there are different policy instruments how you can reach these goals. And so the classic idea in policy making is that somehow the policy makers, they define the, the goals, what should be done. And then they ask the experts, how should we do it? Yeah? And then the experts suggest what's the best way to reach a given goal. And the scientists, you know, they stand back and say, no, we don't, whatever you tell us to do, we'll tell you the best way to do it. It's not up to us to say what society should do. Yeah, this is a, the classic uh, stance somehow in, in, and if you look at an econ textbook, this is typically what they will, what they will say. And uh, yeah, and then it's typically saying, you know, there are various ways. This has, these, these are the pros and cons if you do this, this is the pros and cons if you do that. But it's up to you to decide, you know, how to balance it. Sometimes you need value judgments to, to do this. Okay, so the choice of means should be based on the evidence. That's the, that's the whole idea of this topic here. So how do we decide what, what should be done to reach these goals? Well, it should somehow be based on evidence. And what, the, what does it mean that is evidence-based? Uh, policy. It means that it, at the end of the day, we're talking about science. So at the end of the day, it means that, the, that what you refer to is somehow done according to good scientific practice. The data, you the way you collected the data, the way you analyzed the data, how you interpreted the data should be up to the standards of science at the end of the day. I think this is what it means, critical assessment, checking, and so on. This is, I think, what it, what one important interpretation of, of evidence. And so it should be based, that's the idea, it should be based on evidence rather than ideology, common sense, anecdote, intuition. It should be based on science. That's somehow the idea. And yeah, so one particular aspect that we as an experimental economists, but maybe also more generally, uh, I think is a more generally valid point, is that uh, evidence-based means to evaluate or to, yeah, to establish what actually works and what not in a causal way. Because if you have a causal understanding that X causes Y, then you have a much better way to control Y because you know, oh, I have to change X, not Z. Yeah? Because there might be a correlation between Z and Y, but if you 
manipulate z, it's not going to affect y. Uh, you need to you need to manipulate x because that's the causal that's the causal thing. Okay, so that's and to understand the causal mechanisms, you need science. That's at the end of the day, what a lot of science is about is to understand causal relations. Okay, so we are that's what universities are particularly strong one is strong in in science, yeah, because I said that's that's what distinguishes us from other Fachhochschulen and whatnot, other groups that teach something. Our teaching is, is research-based. And so we're good at that. And, uh, but sometimes the members of a policy of a university also do non-scientific policy advice. So they raise awareness, they're activists maybe. Yeah, so some professors, they go out there and, you know, they, yeah, activists, which is not based on, on hard scientific evidence, what they say, yeah? uh, which might be a useful thing socially. It's debatable. Yeah? It's, it's, well, it's not scientific anyway. And uh, it's also about trying to affect what are the goals, what, what government should do. So the academics also do that. But again, it's not about this classic idea. Is, this is not in line with this classic idea. I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. I'm just saying it's not the classic idea. Scientists may not be better suited than others to do these things. Uh, it's not clear why artists could be just as good at raising awareness, yeah, Bono, or, you know, so, you know, why do you need a scientist to do that? It's not so clear. Okay. So, anyway, scientists provide evidence. What is it? Uh, so I'm talking now about a very naive view. So this is what maybe you can sometimes find in textbook <laughs> or uh, maybe sometimes in a newspaper or sometimes in conventional discussion, people sometimes have these naive views about what is scientific policy advice. So the idea is somehow you can cast it somehow in terms of demand and supply, or what, what I will do. So the idea is somehow the scientists, they supply the things you know, and what do they supply? They provide the evidence, which is objective, trustworthy, authoritative, truthful, and relevant. Okay. And then they explain how to interpret this evidence and give clear recommendations. So now, given the, you know, this is the logic, this is what you need to do. It's clear. Uh, right. Right, so this is the supply side and then there's the demand side. And depending on how you look at it, it's not necessarily only the government who demands things. There are other groups, the general public, media policymakers. They would listen attentively to the scientists. You can already see from this description where I'm going. I will say, you know, this fails in many grounds. Yeah? So they listen attentively to scientists, to the, yeah, and they are all very good and clear and they all agree on everything. Understand what the scientists say, they believe what they say, and then support the advice that the scientists give. And then policymakers do what the public wants and uh, that's then in the public interest. So this is somehow the naive view of how this policy advice works. And the next three or four slides are about how this can fail in what ways this can fail. And it can, yeah, I could have added some more slides. It can fail in many ways. <laughs> so what can go wrong is, uh, I will first start with the supply side and then talk about the demand side. So one is science is not like that. Yeah? This is, uh, is expecting too much of science. Science is uh, often a difficult progress uh, process. So one way of thinking of what science is about is about truth and progress, yeah? Science is about establishing what is the case and what is not case, what is true. And this truth is uh, preliminary, yeah? So this, these whole ideas that I'm describing here a bit fluffily, they have actually been developed here in Vienna, the Wiener Kreis, a bit more than 100 years ago, this logical empiricism, the idea that rational reasoning should be connected with empirical evidence. This, this was an idea that was started here about 200 years ago. 
bit more than 100 years ago. And so the idea is truth is preliminary. It should be challenged, can be falsified, it must be corroborated. And then there's a process that will lead to progress. Yeah? So in the sense that we believe what we believe today is closer to truth than what we believed yesterday. This is progress. Yeah? And that's a positive, optimistic view of what this whole enterprise is, is one particular view. There are other more cynical views about this, but this one optimistic view. And, but most people don't think about science, or I don't know whether most, but many people don't see it like that. They have too high expectations about what scientists can tell them, the truth and white and black. And it's not like that. It's preliminary. Yeah, there's progress. Uh, and then individuals err. We are all humans. You know, scientists make mistakes. This is normal. Huh? This is normal that individuals err. And the idea in this ideal world is that the system corrects these errors. There's refereeing, for example. Yeah? This is you write the paper, send it in, someone else will check it and say, you know, this is actually wrong, what you're claiming here. But there's your, your explanation is not coherent. Yeah? So this is the syst there is a system trying to eradicate errors um, in many ways, replication, for example. Right. So yeah, we can maybe later discuss how plausible is this idea for the social scientists. There are other there are many problems with that, like replication crisis, uh, fads and fashions. Yeah, some economists here, of course, know there's, uh, if you look at a bit longer horizons, the Keynesians and the monetarists, and there are fads and fashions in social science that come and go. Um, yeah, so there are different views. How, how good is this view? What is, what is science? How does it pro progress? Is this a one, one important question? So that goes into the way of this policy advice. And uh, of course, as an experimental economist, I'm particularly keen on understanding these causal effects. And, uh, but the thing is, uh, it's a tricky thing with experimental economics or with experiments in general, is that you can sometimes, it, to, to be able to really pin down a, a causal effect, you have to look at something simple or constrained, yeah? where you can know what the variables are and you can manipulate something and you can measure the effect. Yeah? But these are sometimes not the questions people ask. People want to know about society. They want to know about complex things. And there, that's a difficult issue about how to do causal knowledge about relevant things. So we can maybe talk more about that later. So second, so I'm talking about how, how this can fail, this naive view. One is, has to do with, the, with what is science. That was somehow the first. The second is the scientist motives. Why do people actually do this? And some are actually driven by truth and progress. It's their mission, you know, they burn for, you know, that's, they burn for this. Uh, they want to make this world a better place. There's, I, this is the great thing about being a vice rector. I actually meet some of these people. This is a great thing. But there are also, I also meet other people uh, as a vice rector. Yeah, they want more salary. They want more this. They want more that. Uh, they want private goods. Uh, so... Scientists are also driven by these things, you know, by fame, by, you know, money, whatnot. And so the tricky thing, uh, and there might be some adverse selection. So the, the, it's, uh, uh, those who care most about the public interest might not be those who do the policy, policy advice. Uh, is, is a kind of a sorting, uh, the sorting might not always work. Uh, and the best scientists are not necessarily those who work hardest for the public good, because they also have lots of other opportunities to get promotion, to get more of this, more of that. And they think, you know, why should I do the public good? Maybe I should do something else. But, you know, there are all different constellations. We have, we have excellent scientists that work for the public good. 
Uh, and so the task of research policy uh, is to set the incentives such that they are somehow aligned, that good scientists actually work also for the public good. So setting private incentives such that it actually works in, for the public because we're a public university. So this is a tricky thing, how to do this. Yeah, and then doing science is actually difficult. Good science is very difficult to do and uh, it's tedious. <laughs> you have to work long hours and go the extra mile. It's very tedious. And so some, many do this, to work very hard, take the responsibility for what they do. Because at the end of the day, if you want the academic freedom, you need the responsibility. You can't have the one without the other. So many, many scientists understand this. Uh, and have high ethics, but not all. Yeah. So some some evidence or some advice that is given looks like scientific evidence, but is actually not based on on hard, you know, hard science, so to speak. Okay. So that was the supply side. What can go wrong on the demand side? Yes. Five minutes. Ooh, I should speed up a little bit. Seven minutes. Okay. I. Okay, so let me let me go then quickly through this. So government, the demand comes partly from government. They ask uh, complex questions and want answers immediately, simple, easy, uh, clear questions. They want fast answers. They want certain answers. But this is not how knowledge is. You know, this is preliminary and often probabilistic. So there, and then there is uh, disappointment. So we ask the scientists, but what do we get? It's useless what we get. Yeah? This is not the answer what we want. And often, uh, sometimes in some e situations, policymakers want to delegate the responsibility to scientists, but you can't do that in many cases because the evidence does not tell you exactly what to do because there are value judgments, there are trade-offs involved. Yeah? Should, should we do, if we do this, there will be more people dying from COVID, but uh, the economic cost will be much lower and the kids can go to school and there will be less depression. So more oral, oral people dying versus depressed kids, you know, what's more important? It's a value judgment, it's difficult to say. Yeah? You can't delegate this to scientists. You can uh, maybe delegate the question to scientists, estimate how many old people will die. That, you, that maybe you can. So they are trade-offs. Yeah. So uh, yeah, maybe I should do this punchline. So government may be looking for policy-based evidence rather than evidence-based policy. Yeah. Uh, this is a very common and problematic issue, the policy-based evidence. So the government is actually not interested may not. I'm not talking about this specific government. I'm not um, it's generic. Yeah. And also everything I say is, uh, is my opinion is not the opinion of the University of Vienna. Yeah. So go generically, government may demand advice not to promote truth and progress, but to promote its own goals, to be reelected, to be popular, uh, you know, and it's not a new thing yeah, that, that people are looking for this kind of evidence or uh, this kind of advice. Yeah? Uh, yeah. And then they also ask particular types of questions that are on their agenda and maybe not the most relevant things. They, hire, they want the hired guns. So they know, oh, we want to push through this legislation, this tax legislation. Let's find someone who gives us arguments that, that we can, you know, go through in the political arena. This is the hired gun. You hire someone to give you ammunition to, to fight in this. So the demand is not for science, scientific advice, but the demand is for policy-based evidence, not the other way around. Sometimes, depends on the situation. And then if you have very bluntly, government may influence what data is collected, how it's interpreted. That's a big question of autonomy of universities. And that also applies to other things. Then media, uh, also the media may not be interested in sober and objective information about science. It's just too boring. Yeah, the sci it's, it, science is often, I mean, it's exciting, I find it, but the nitty gritty thing is uh, tedious. 
and uh, the the media may need to sell their copies yeah? or they might to attract large audiences so you need infotainment you need spectacular things so there's a tendency to produce for scientists if they want to appear on the media they should produce spectacular results because otherwise nobody pays attention so if yeah also in the publications yeah because even the journal editors they want something spectacular if someone shows what we thought anyway to be true they say yeah so what we knew this anyway we didn't know it but we just thought it that it was the case yeah and then if you show something spectacular most likely it's actually wrong yeah because by the nature of statistics, this is so. If it's spectacular, it's unexpected. And if it's unexpected, most likely it's actually wrong. So there's a logic in this uh, that the news want exciting things. And also there's a negativity bias. The news likes to present things that are negative. Disasters, crime, uh, crisis. They like to talk about these. They're hardly positive news. Yeah, life expectancy in the last three years has increased by three months. Wow, isn't that great? That's the headline. No, it's not. Yeah. Or, or you know, the, the, the standard of living is higher than 10 years ago. This headline in the newspapers. No, it's not. The positive news is, is not interesting somehow. They like negative, spectacular things. There's actually, I could talk more about this. Um, there's also a, a psychological factors playing a role here. Confirmation bias is one of them. So people like to read things that they thought, see, I knew it. Yeah. It's, it's, again, we see that this is true. This is the So you have your ideological predisposition. You see the, the, the news and you think, oh, I'm confirmed again. So you people actually actively seek uh, news that is in line with their ideological predisposition. So uh, left voters tend to read left newspapers, right voters tend to read right newspapers. In the US, this is very pronounced. Now there's polarization. Uh, and also in the social media, you can see these self-reinforcing things. Uh, homophily, we tend to like things that, so things are starting to shake now, which probably means I should stop uh, group thing. So there's many more psychological things. Uh, I could have talked about populism. Why do why do ordinary people don't trust experts? There are reasons for that. Um, but still, you know, somehow the public expects scientists to that we engage in this policy advice. They want us to do this, and uh, or many people, two thirds in at least in in Europe. And so we give them guidelines on how to do it. If you must do it, this is how to do it. I don't go into details. I will skip this. I took far too many slides for the time. Let me summarize what I wanted to say. So universities influence policymaking in the long run through their research and through their many graduates. This is a big impact we have on society. We participate in public discourse, in the media, in uh, panel discussion, this has long run and impacts. We also have direct effects. Uh, yeah, but what we actually should do, this is a bit paradoxical, what we actually, so first of all, the university as such never provides advice. Yeah, this is something when the media, you say a study, the University of Vienna, a study of the University of Vienna has shown no, University of Vienna does no studies. Individuals do studies, and they are hired at the University of Vienna. Uh, the university as such does no advice, uh, does not provide advice. And uh, paradoxically, what we should somehow do as a university, as a public university, we should not provide the evidence that could be provided by other private suppliers. Uh, so by the consultants, by uh, maybe even EIS and, and VIFO, maybe we should not do this because there are other players who are specialized in doing this. We should provide stuff that uh, is long run, that is, um, you know, is, is, you know, the advisors are also under pressure. You have some budget, you have some time limit, and then you have to come up with a report. Scientists don't have to do this. 
we can write for years on a paper. Yeah, this is we're not under pressure. And that's what we should do. That's what we're in some sense. We are we're here to provide the public goods, the things that the market cannot provide in some sense. Uh, right. So we should paradoxically, we should provide advice that is not demanded some, some, in some sense, yeah? because the demand is also biased. Yeah? That's, that's what I want to uh, quote. And if you really have to provide paid advice, then follow our guidelines. You can download them and it says, you know, be transparent uh, with the sources you use. Uh, right there, follow good practice in science. So we have guidelines. So that's, uh, yeah, there are other things I wanted to say, but uh, for the sake of time, thank you very much.